<laughs> Hello, freak bitches. So my final point is is the falsifiability one. That is, uh, what would it take to refute your hypothesis? Like, for me, the answer would be, like, if Go Gobekli Tepe turned out to be what you think it might have been, the place where advanced ancient civilization once inhabited or they used it, where are the metal tools? Where are the writing, the, the examples of writing? Perhaps a decision where was made not to use metal. Perhaps a decision was made that uh, errors had taken place, that, that, that in reinventing civilization, we shouldn't perhaps go down quite the same route as before. Uh, perhaps writing isn't always an advance. Uh, perhaps perhaps uh, an oral tradition which, which records in memory, which enhances and uses the power of memory, may be a very effective way of, of, of dealing with information. We regard writing as, a, as an advance, and I can see lots of reasons why it is an advance, but if we put ourselves into the heads of ancient peoples, maybe it wasn't. I mean, there's a tradition from ancient Egypt that the god Thoth God of wisdom was the inventor of writing, but we have, we have a text in which he is, he is questioned by a, a pharaoh who is, who is saying, well, actually, have you really done a good thing by introducing writing? Because then the words may roam around the world without wise advice to, to put them into, into context and what will happen to memory when people... So, so there might be a choice not to, not to okay, go that way. Okay, all right, but, but then what do you mean by advance? When you say there used to be a lost advanced civilization before 10,000 years ago... Well, let's just pause here mean? for a second, because what, what we know for a fact is that the carbon dating in all the area around Gobekli Tepe is somewhere around 12,000 years. Is that correct? 11,600 years ago okay, is, is so, the earliest they found so far, but a great deal of Gobekli Tepe is still underground. Right, so at least what we know is someone built some pretty impressive structures 11,600 yeah, yeah. years ago. 7,000 years before Stonehenge. So when, when that story broke, this is l long before you, you came along with your book, uh, it was controversial in the sense that we thought hunter-gatherers <coughs> could not do something like this because to do that you need a large population mm -hmm. with a division of labor and so forth. And, and so what the, the response to archaeologists was, well, I guess we were wrong about hunter-gatherers. Maybe they can do more stuff than we gave them credit for. So why is that not a reasonable hypothesis versus they were, it was actually advanced, but we mean something completely different by advanced, not writing and metal and technology. We mean, I don't know what you mean. What do you mean? Well, I mean, we have, we have a body of archaeology which goes on for decades, which is <clears> saying <throat> that uh, megalithic sites, for example, Gigantia, in Malta or Hagarim or Manidra, megalithic sites uh, date to no older than five and a half to six thousand years old. G G Gigantia would push it close to six thousand years old, and th th there are no older sites than that. And th therefore, that the megalithic site is associated with a certain stage of Neolithic development. Then along comes Gobekli Tepe, seven thousand years older than Stonehenge, incredibly sophisticated site, very large scale. I mean, Klaus Schmidt. Sadly, he's passed away. I, I spent three days working the site with him. He was very generous to me. He showed me a lot. He talked to me a lot. And he said basically 50 times as much as they've already excavated is still, is still under the ground, that there's hundreds and hundreds of giant stone pillars that they've identified with ground-penetrating radar. He's not even sure if they're ever if they're ever going to excavate them. But by all accounts, we are looking, if we take what's still under the ground into account, we're looking at the largest megalithic site that's ever been created on Earth. And it pops up 11,600 years ago with no obvious background to it. It just comes well, out of nowhere. We, now, that to me, that's, that's rather, pu well, that we know of. But to me, that's, a, that's immediately a rather puzzling and an interesting situation. And I would be remiss as, as an author and an inquirer into these matters if I didn't take great interest in that. The sudden appearance, 7,000 years before Stonehenge, of a megalithic site that dwarfs Stonehenge, to me, that's a mystery. And it's really worth inquiring into. We well, love to mystery, put it into yeah. perspective, that's more than 2,000 years older than what we now consider to be the building of the Great Pyramid of Giza. In, com in comparison to us to then mm -hmm. so between mm -hmm. our time now in 2017 and the construction of the Great Pyramid you're talking about 2,000 years earlier than that I mean that is mm. unbelievable when you're talking about 7,000 years before what we thought mm. people were doing yeah. okay but but my point was that instead of before we go down the road of constructing a lost civilization that was super advanced but different from our idea of advanced, why not just attribute to these fully modern 
hunter-gatherers who had the same size brains we have and so on, that they were able to figure out and do this. We just underestimated their abilities. But why did archaeologists tell us for so long hunter-gatherers couldn't do it and we needed agricultural well, populations that could generate well, surpluses that could pay for the yes, specialists to... that was to the theory. But that was, uh, so now what archaeologists are saying, well, I guess we were wrong about hunter-gatherers. Well, yeah. they might be wrong about hunter-gatherers or there might be another civilization that they had not discovered that has been unearthed oh, by time. Okay, but After, uh, sorry, Michael, lost, so lost, ci lost civilizations are not such an extraordinary idea. I mean, nobody knew that the Indus Valley civilization existed at all until some railway work was done around Mohenjo-Daro in, right. in 1923. Suddenly, a whole civilization pops up out of the woodwork that's just never been taken into account before the 1920s. We still can't read its script, you know. The, the idea that we, that we come across that another turn of the spade reveals information that causes us to reconsider not just was it hunter-gatherers or agriculturalists, but perhaps something bigger than this is involved. Or in between that's, that. That's not, that's not such an extraordinary idea. I get it that mainstream archaeology doesn't want to go there, but that's my job no, to I don't, go there. I don't think that, that that's correct. They, mm -hmm. they would be happy to go there if there's evidence for it. By what you just said, they now fully accept the Indus Valley civilizations. How did that happen if they were dogmatically closed-minded? And, and, I don't and, say that and, they were dogmatically uh, close-minded about that. The evidence, the massive amount of evidence that came up with the discovery of Mohenjo-Daro, Harappa, Dolavira, and other, and other such sites, it's very difficult. You have to be completely stupid to, to, to say that that's not a civilization. Gobekli Tepe is a bit more nuanced. You know, we have, stone, we have stone circles. We have some interesting astronomical alignments. The world's first perfectly north-south aligned building. Maybe. No, definitely. Again, that's a patternicity thing. Like, well, I'm citing Klaus Schmidt. Uh, you know. I'm, well, that's all right. But I, uh, any of us who read back into history... 10,000 years ago, what we're thinking, that they might have been thinking, that's always a dangerous for anybody, not, not, not just you, all that's of us. That's a good point. Who's Klaus Schmidt? Klaus Schmidt was the original excavator of Gobekli Tepe. He was the, the head of the German Archaeological Institute dig at Gobekli Tepe. He kindly spent three days showing me uh, a, a, around the site. And, and really nobody's disputing the astronomical alignments of Gobekli Tepe. They weren't particularly interesting to Klaus Schmidt, but they're there. And what is the alignment? Like, how is it established? Well, when you have a, a perfectly north-south north -south aligned structure, perfectly north-south, to true north, not magnetic north, then you are dealing with astronomy by definition. And there are other alignments of the stone circles. True north as established today or with the precession of the equinoxes? True north is always about true north. Okay. It's the rotation axis of our planet. Okay, so it, it, to this day, it points exactly in the same place where it was pointing? It always points to true north. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but back to this, you know, they don't want to go. Sure, they want to go there. They would happy be happy to go there. Case in point, two weeks ago in the journal Nature, the most prestigious scientific journal in the world, there was published an article that humans or maybe Neanderthals lived in San Diego area 130,000 years ago. This is an order of magnitude older than the Clovis date. This of was 13, the, the mastodon bones they found that were mastodon smashed. Mastodon bones, yes. They so, so here's an example of how, okay, so uh, clearly there's not some conspiracy to keep alternative people or fringe or, or radical theories out. It was published in peer-reviewed, the most prestigious journal in the world. There it is. And then ago. what happened? Well, well hasn't, hasn't there been a massive reaction to that and lots of lots of scathing remarks by other of, academics? Yes, yes. And that's how, but that's normal. That's how yes. science works. Yeah. You get you get pushed back. It's you got to have a thick skin. It's just the way it goes. You got to have a thick skin. That's that's for sure. But maybe sometimes your skin is so thick that you just can't sense anything around. Well, you. of course, we don't want that either. I so, mean, what want, do you we, think is going on when you look at something like Gobekli Tepe that's covered, covered up purposefully, right? Yeah, yes, years deliberately years? buried. Again, I cite Klaus Schmidt. He, he's the authority on this. He's the excavator. He absolutely adamantly insists that that site was deliberately buried and finally covered with a hill, which is what Gobekli Tepe means in the Turkish language, pot-bellied hill. Yeah. And the, you're talking about something. Give me the perspective of how large they believe it is currently, as of current... What's excavated at the moment is on a scale of Stonehenge. What's under the ground may be as much as 50 times larger. Jesus. But, but at Gobekli Tepe, there, no one lived there. There's no tools. There's no... Well, you're talking about 12,000 years old, though. But if it's buried, it should be, there should be pottery. There's no pottery, no writing, no articles of clothing. No one lived there. Well, you're saying nobody lived there, so why should they have pottery? Why should pottery be in the fill? But, but why, would they about, go, why would they go along and break some pots and stick it in but, the artificial fill? But how fill? about something? <sighs> They're trash. When they, something that would indicate it's different, a different kind of people than what we're used to seeing yeah. in the archaeological record. Well, in other words... Well, it's just in rubbish words, that they poured in. It's just stones and earth, it, buckets it, of it. In other words, Graham, for, for you to gain 
uh, support for your theory amongst mainstream archaeologists. They want to see positive evidence to overturn the old theory. In other words, the burden of proof is on the person challenging the mainstream. I in, completely in, in, agree. In every field. But isn't there some proof that the 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 mainstream idea of these hunters and gatherers never had anything in what the theory was that would indicate these people were capable of building something even remotely the size of Gobekli Tepe. Yeah, to me, that's the stunning beauty of this find. It, it overturns our ideas of primitive hunter-gatherers that could not do this. Apparently, they can. It, so, that's one so possible is, yeah, assessment. That's right. So this, I call this, somebody else called it, the bigotry of low expectations. You know, it's like we had this kind of low expectations for these hunter-gatherers. Maybe we should jettison that idea. And in my own other field of the history of religion, it also threw that off because this apparently was a, a kind of a spiritual religious. That's the wrong word. They wouldn't have used. Actually, nobody like that, can. Nobody can know that. that that's right. So, but if it was, this is the, the big National Geographic article emphasized that maybe this is the very first religious spiritual temple ever built because they didn't live there. So they went there but for a reason. Isn't it also possible that this is signs that civilization was more advanced twelve thousand years ago than we thought? Okay, more advanced. What do we again? What do we mean by? We're advanced? talking about the ability to the, the, to construct an amazing structure. Well, okay. The, how big was it? Like with, how with, tall were these with, with stones? Some of them are twenty feet tall. Yeah, but some but, of them are smaller with 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 uh, astronomical alignments. Klaus Schmidt called it a center of innovation. He was intrigued by the way that agriculture emerges around Gobekli Tepe at the same time that Gobekli Tepe is, is, is created. I mean, he, he went on record with me. Perhaps he's not right, but he went on record with me as saying that was the first agriculture. These were the people who invented agriculture. Now, to me, the notion that a group of hunter-gatherers wake up one morning and invent megalithic architecture, the world's largest megalithic site, and at the same moment invent agriculture, stretches credulity a bit. And I think I would prefer to propose, and I have proposed, that what we're looking at is evidence of some kind of transfer of technology, that people came into that area who had other knowledge, <coughs> and that that was applied. And perhaps they mobilized the local population around this site. Perhaps that's precisely why we see agriculture developing there. So perhaps that's the skill that's being passed on. But, but I don't see anything particularly... Sp okay, the stone work is spectacular, but that, that's not any more advanced than... A few cent a few millennium afterwards. But you're talking about something 20 feet but, but, tall, but made we, of stone. We, but we know a by couple people that were hunter gatherers. But a couple hundred people can move multi-ton stones. There's no but, mystery in moving the stones. That, They're that's still right, moving 20-ton right. stones in Indonesia today. Yeah, I mean, but megalithic the, cultures still exist. Right. You also know that the carving on the outside is extremely complex. It's three-dimensional carving. Okay, but I mean, but you know what that okay, means. But, Lasko, but do you know what that means? But Lasko at thirty thousand years ago has magnificent cave paintings with three dimensional right, but that's animals. Paint, but that's painting. You know well, that they. But, 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 but the, do you know, hold on a second. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying when I say three dimensional carvings? Yeah, like the the Venus. The no, Milo. the carvings were on the outside, meaning yeah. they didn't carve them into the rock. They carved away the rock right, around them, right. which is pretty sophisticated stuff for hunter gatherers. And they're doing this on these twenty foot tall stone columns. I mean, it's pretty impressive stuff. Okay, but th there the assumption is that they, they couldn't have figured this out. We know from modern societies where, say, Australian Aborigines, uh, in one generation, they go from stone tools to flying airplanes. The brains are quite capable of doing these amazing things. Did it's they the go same from, brain. Did, did yeah, they go from they stone, stone tools no, to no, flying no, airplanes without somebody introducing exactly. them to airplanes? Yeah, you, you're actually making his argument for him. No, no. <laughs> it's not that much of a reach to carve stone. It, it, people have been carving stones but for thousands of years. But the entire archaeological opinion on megalithic sites for decades before this was precisely that it was beyond their ability right. to do and, that. And now the mainstream has changed its okay, mind well about let's, this. Let's or at the very least, a they little said, shift. They, they, let's they, pause they said, for a moment. Yeah, let's pause right. for a moment. So for sure, we all agree human beings made this. Yes, not yes. aliens. Okay. Even so, he, the he argument, the aliens. so the <laughs> argument is not whether or not aliens made it. The argument is whether or not humans made it that were sophisticated. <clears throat> well, they're clearly sophisticated enough to make this incredible structure that is, is some sign of some sort of civilization. I, mean, I believe so, yeah. It, it is. It's and, a and gigantic here I, structure. I, here I agree with Graham that we've, we've, again, undersold who these people were. My friend Jared Diamond goes to Papua New Guinea. And he talks at the, in the opening chapter of Guns, Germs, and Steel how smart these people are that live out there in nature and what it takes to survive. Oh, sure. he, he wouldn't last an hour. You know, from L.A., he wouldn't last an hour with his Papua New Guinean friends out there in the, in the wild. 
Well, that's and, just and that, because he doesn't know how to survive, and they've been and passing they do, down right. the information right. for so generation they're after very, generation. Very smart. Okay, so it's not sure. a, it's not a problem of intelligence. And is there? Uh, okay, so here's the other thing we don't know is that there might be lots more of these sites, and and where there's, there's there a, are. A, I visited yeah. one of them, Karahan Tepe. You've got you've got the T-shaped pillars sticking out the side of a hill in a farmer's backyard. I mean, I I think we're actually at the beginning of opening up this inquiry, not at the end of it. By okay, any so but, means. but then before you, before, okay, why not just say we don't know? This is a spectacular mystery, and leave it at that. Right? Why write a book? That well, says, you guys on I'm the fill in all the gaps. You guys on the mainstream side won't speculate and won't explore. I don't claim to be an archaeologist. I'm not a scientist. I'm an author. It's my job to offer an alternative point of view and to offer a coherently argued alternative point of view. And I must say, Gobekli Tepe strikes me as a gigantic fucking mystery and a mystery that is worthy of exploration from a point of view that may not satisfy you. Oh, well, it does, you don't have to satisfy me. You and uh, your, you and your <laughs> colleagues. And I, don't, I, but, don't, but, I certainly don't have to satisfy you or them. That's but, not but, my project. But like your opening chapter with Schmidt, I thought I really loved the, um, the, the kind of conversational style you had with Schmidt in the book where he's dialoguing, where Schmidt goes and look at this. And then he says, but, but, but. What? Wait, what's that again? Is it like a little bit like Columbo? Like, wait, wait, I have just one more, just one more question, and you know the mystery kind of thickens. That's perfectly okay. That's great. I mean, mm. that's that's what science is all about: is uncovering mysteries that we then have to figure out. So there's always more mysteries, mm. but that doesn't mean that's not positive evidence in favor of a particular theory, like a lost civilization. It's just we can't explain this. Full stop. Yeah, we certainly can't explain it, and you can't explain it by saying that we underestimated hunter and gatherers either. Well, why not? We know they made it, whatever you want to call them. Well, we know humans made it. That's right. We know humans but, made but it. So whatever the, you want to call why, them. But uh, why do they believe that people were only hunters and gatherers twelve thousand years ago? It's because they didn't have any evidence to the contrary. Right. This is evidence to the contrary. I agree. So you agree that there weren't hunter and, hunter and gatherers? Okay. But there's there's several stages in between, just you know, twelve people living out in the jungle by themselves versus sure. us. You know, there's like a whole bunch of different. Well, I would say that Gobekli Tepe is a gigantic stage. Well, we don't. Okay, they didn't live there, so we we have to figure out what well, where where were they living and what was there. So that that has to be excavated. Well, they only have excavated ten percent of it. Right? And meanwhile, and meanwhile, what you're saying is that we shouldn't speculate at all because I mean, mainstream archaeology is speculating. No, speculating. Mainstream archaeology is speculating okay. when saying it's definitely was hunter gatherers who did this. That's also that a speculation. That seems more of a reach. Okay, but not okay. It may, they, they may be more than hunter gatherers. They they may have been partially settled. There's you can have any kind of number of states. But like, what you can't apparently have is the possibility of a transfer of technology from people who were really masters of that technology already okay, but, when they but, came in. But where are these people? Where's where, well, you're dealing with where, an incredible where are their homes? twelve thousand years ago. Well, their fingerprints are there. Let's find their homes. I don't know. I don't know that their homes matter. Would their homes even survive after twelve thousand years? Well, homes. I'm not sure. They're trash. But what survives? Tools, they're something. Well, what? Screw trash, trash and tools. We've got Gobekli Tepe. It confronts us. It challenges the mainstream model. I think it's reasonable to consider the possibility that there was something more than just hunter-gatherers involved here in creating this extraordinary place. Okay. And that's all I've done. It seems to me that to, to say hunter-gatherers could build this, I uh, wouldn't be opposed to the idea that they're hunting and gathering, but it does certainly imply a lot of leisure time. Yes. A lot of oh, leisure time. Well, and, we know hunter Oh, sorry. It's okay. It's like... Well, again, if we place this back particularly within that, that climate zone at 11,006 to 12,000, 13,000 years ago, whatever it turns out to be, we're dealing with a, an extremely demanding and challenging climate. Which, which wouldn't necessarily, to my mind, be conducive to the emergence of a settled culture that would be capable of undertaking a project on this scale. And as somebody who's built a lot of things and moved quite a few heavy weights in my time, um, I, I find it the, the idea sort of um, perplexing to me that they would be, what I, what I would have to ask is what is their motive? What is their motive for undertaking a project on this scale? Because it's an enormous project. And to move a 20 ton block of stone is really a challenging task to undertake today today well without without you know uh you know the infrastructure of 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 large uh machines and so forth um but to do it by hand 
it, it would be an enormous undertaking. And, and I, you know, to me, it's like, when are they having time to hunt and gather when you're engaged in a project of this scale? But, but we know hunter-gatherers have way more free time than modern society people do. That's the one thing we've learned is that it, it's a pretty good way to make a living, actually. They have a better varied <coughs> diet than we have. This is the, you know, the Neanderthal diet, right? They have a better varied diet and a lot more free time. Yeah, but that's and a lot more, a lot less stress. We knew that so, all along about hunter-gatherers right. when we were saying they couldn't build megalithic sites. But we're we're, so we're looking at time. a time, time to do it where where the environment is undergoing rapid changes to which adaptations would be extremely challenging, and we know those changes are going on all over the planet. We know that sea levels are ri rapidly rising over a period of a few thousand years, from from a uh, sea stand low of about 400 feet up to the present level. We also know that that biotas were shifting dramatically all over the planet. The, the, the effects of the Younger Dryas were global. Pretty much that is, I think, the emerging consensus now, that, that both hemispheres, north and south, were being affected by the climate changes of the Younger Dryas. So what we're doing is we're placing this, this phenomena, this, this project within this context of these extremely challenging times in which you know adaptation to the environmental changes could easily be the the all-consuming challenge of the times. I, I'm just finding it difficult to imagine a, a disconnect, to, to see this disconnect between a project of this magnitude and the motive for doing it during a time when obviously the environment could be posing serious constraints upon people's ability to function in that well, Randall, we don't even know the motives of the Easter Islanders and, no, and we why don't. they ra ra raised these huge debts, but we know they did it. But and, isn't and, that become a central question, though? What Something had to have motivated them. But the, let's get back Clearly. to Tepe. Yeah. So, we, so let's just be real clear here. We know they're humans. We know that it's at least 12,000 years old. And we know that the real dispute here, the real question is, did these people have structures and did they have agriculture? We know that they were human beings. They were essentially modern human beings. So were they hunter-gatherers, or did they have structures well, and agriculture? Before Gobekli Tepe, they didn't have structures and they didn't have agriculture. Can After Gobekli Tepe, they did. Yeah. So the yeah. fact that yeah. they were able to build something so monumental, what kind of a leap is it at all to think that these people could figure out how to plant food and figure out how to make a house? Well... I mean, again, if you look back 30,000 years, 40,000 years to these cave paintings, these are pretty sophisticated. Yeah. Beautiful. They are. Clearly, they had abstract reasoning. They could think from the concrete to the abstract and so on. It's not a big reach to go from that to uh, moving stones around. I'd say there's a big difference between painting and engraving on yeah. cave walls. I and, don't think and, so. And I mean, to and me, the painting and, is even sorry, more sophisticated. Sorry, and creating the largest megalithic site that's ever been built on earth wait a minute i think there's a bit, huge difference between those two i mean nobody would compare the construction effort on on stonehenge or, or gigantia with with cave paintings i agree with you the cave paintings are magnificent i've had the privilege to visit many of the painted caves stunning work and as picasso said when he came out of lasco we have invented nothing right i mean they right. were this that was that modern human mind symbolic mind at, at right. work there but this is another matter this is a large-scale construction project that's going on and it's not just a construction project it's not like huts it's hundreds and hundreds of very very large megalithic pillars which have to be mobilized brought to the place you know organizing a workforce uh, in order to do that even that requires preparation and time and learning and practice it's not something that you wake up one morning and just can do overnight you think that the paintings are more impressive than go back with Tappy? yeah or at least comparable yeah, I, because think that's, to, I think but, that's absolutely ridiculous. To, to, to convey three-dimensionality on a 2D uh, plane, that, uh, that's what Picasso meant. It's like, wow, that's incredible. It's like developing perspective. And to use the natural shape but of it's the just, walls it's, but it's not, to create a three-dimensional perspective look, is it, that's pretty abstract. You're comparing it apples is, and pears. It's not yeah. a construction project. Okay, it's, so it's it's not, I don't think we it's don't even remotely. Them, but you, I don't think it's even remotely but as But what impressive. I'm saying is that it, it doesn't take a huge leap of the imagination to think these people were pretty smart. They had well, we know that they were smart. Like we know what they were smart no, just dispute. because of the fact that those construction projects were done by who? By whoever. We know that they were smart. Whoever built Gobekli Tepe was clearly intelligent. Whoever made those 3D carvings, hey. clearly they were intelligent. But to think that someone drawing on cave paintings is more impressive more than impressive. erecting 20-foot stone columns yeah, okay. with three-dimensional carvings on them of a lot of animals that weren't even n native to the, to the region.
That's uh, so, yeah, is that so debatable? not necessarily the case. Yeah, because they could have been. No. They the, the animals were native to, But my point, uh, Joe, region. is that these paintings are like say thirty, forty thousand years old to Gobekli Tepe. So there's tens of thousands of years to develop more that we that we're uh, lo- very likely to find more archaeological uh, but, sites. Uh, and yet, yeah, up, up till up till sites. now, we haven't found that. We haven't we haven't found all of that intermediate material. Which sees, see, if I if I could actually see that intermediate material between the upper, upper Paleolithic cave art and Gobekli Tepe, if I could see the gradual evolution and development of skills, I wouldn't need to invoke uh, a lost civilization, the survivors of a lost civilization who've mastered those skills elsewhere to come in and teach those skills at Gobekli Tepe, but it still looks to me like a transfer of technology unless you can show me that evolutionary process whereby I can understand how this group of hunter-gatherers became equipped to create this giant site, where they practiced, where they learned the skills to move the stones, to organize the workforce, to feed and water the workforce in a rather dry place. All of that is actually quite a logistical challenge. Yep, and obviously somebody met it somehow. Some humans. Yes, right. So the right, real question right. is, did they have structures? Did they have agriculture? Did they have some sort of probably, a community where they lived in an established location? Like I, would, I would imagine so. So that would push back the time where we thought that there was a civilization. That would push them back into a realm of at least ste- stepping out of the hunter-gatherer stage. Now, correct? your guy Schmidt, as you show in your book, he, he did not go as far as you, you go. Certainly not. Right. No. Uh, but he admitted it's a mystery. Okay, why, that would be the scientific approach. I don't know what it is. Great mystery. Let's just wait and see. Mm. Versus, uh, I'm going to postulate a, a lost civilization. Nothing wrong with that, Graham. Mm. It's a free country, and, and scientists do this all the time, as as you've mentioned. <laughs> there's so, a, so there's this- a rather humorous thing, which I have to say. Actually, I might even ask Jamie to pull up the um, the uh, couple of images of uh, fingerprints of the gods. That's the book I'm best known for. Uh, and when I uh, published Fingerprints of the Gods in 1995, essentially I was saying civilization is much older and much more mysterious than we thought. And I was ridiculed for proposing that. 2013, one of the magazines that ridiculed me, New Scientist magazine in Britain, publishes as a cover story, picture of Gobekli Tepe and the headline civilization is much older and <laughs> okay. much more mysterious than, right, we, fair enough, than we thought fair enough okay fair enough and and and, and scientists do do this i mean i've followed <clears throat> paleoanthropology for my whole adult life and one of the big mysteries is how did we get a big brain how do we get to abstract reasoning from from say what chimps can do no one knows the doubling of the human brain it, size yeah, over we, a period uh, okay. of two million years and right? because no one knows uh, every couple of years, there's a new book out. It's climate change. It was the throwing uh, arm, c- th- cooking that's food, right. cooking meat. You know, mm-hmm. meat is another big one. A Harvard professor, meat. Okay, and these books come and go, and some of them have legs, some of them don't, and it, it's just the way it goes. And, and then re- there's Terence McKenna's. It's pretty theory. obvious it was psychedelics. Yeah, that's <laughs> Terence McKenna's. <laughs> Not that made the brain theory. bigger, but that. Switch yeah. the brain. Oh, is this on. the old Julian? Um, the uh, tr- Julian Jaynes, no, no, the bicameral mind, not at all. This is David Lewis Williams, who's professor of anthropology at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. His neuropsychological theory of cave art. Uh, all kudos to Terence McKenna and Food of the Gods. He, what a brilliant thinker, what a brilliant alternative thinker. But David Lewis Williams at the University of Witwatersrand had been working on this problem since 1973, and his, his argument is that the remarkable similarities that we see in rock and cave art all around the world uh, are explained that we're dealing with a shamanistic art. Shamanism involves altered states of consciousness. This is typical visions of altered states of consciousness, and it seems to have accompanied a great leap forward in human behavior. As and you does, covered this in your book. I covered it in Supernatural. Supernatural. Yeah. As did uh, you know Richard Wrangham's theory. He's this is a highly regarded um, scientist at Harvard. So he's the meat eating guy. That mm-hmm. you know, it's right. cooking meat. Right. That, that, so by cooking the protein, that's what gives you the energy to build a huge brain. All right. So now this guy is starting with ten ten pluses on his side. He's Harvard and already respected. Right. And. Even so, his book was like, eh, maybe. Well, it's probably a series of different events and a bunch of different factors. That's right. It could be a number of different things. (laughs) 